So welcome everyone to the science of science fiction. My name is Rufus Cochran. Um, I am the founder and executive director of Indiana Sciences. You can follow us at Indiana Sciences. Um, and we've got a fantastic talk for you tonight. We're doing Gen Con online. Um, I'll tell you, after last night's presentation, uh, really great reactions, a lot of great conversation and discussion. Um, you can check that out on our Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, our Facebook Live. Um, we had a presentation about um, Wookiees, if they are more like cats or dogs or humans. Um, we had a talk on cryptids, which are all those crazy monsters out and about in the world. Um, and we had a really cool talk on the D&D &D physics of traps. Um, just a really fun presentation. Any aspiring uh, DMs out there, uh, definitely go back and give that a watch. It's a really fun presentation. Um, and you can catch that at Indiana Sciences on any of our social media. So I'm not going to talk too much because uh, I've kept the uh, waiting room here filled with uh, idle chatter for too long. And I want to get to the uh, the presenters uh, that we've got here. So our talk will go one, two, three um, through three topics. Tonight's theme is zombies and the zombie apocalypse. So button up for that. This is going to be a lot of fun. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Bill Sullivan. He is the Showalter Professor of Pharmacology and Toxicology at the IU School of Medicine. Um, also the author of Please to Meet Me, which is a fantastic uh, book about genes, germs, and the curious forces that make us who we are. Um, our second speaker, so honored to have our first international panel from the Edinburgh Medical School at the University of Edinburgh. We have Dr. Janet Phillip, who is the head um, of administration, the Deanery of Biomedical Sciences, um, also the founder of Anatomy Found, which is a fantastic um, social media account, the science communication, highly encourage you uh, to follow that. And then finally, uh, we have Rachel Cochran, PE professional engineer, um, does design work um, in medical and um, academic facilities, designs electrical systems, um, and she's going to be talking about the electrical grid during a zombie apocalypse. So a lot of those things you see in The Walking Dead and other zombie shows, after you get a, a little backup for um, what actually happens from the zombie apocalypse, uh, you might have a different perception of the show. So, <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, we're going to hop into our first speaker, um, Dr. Bill Sullivan first. Um, but we just want to say quick idea, um, quick note, please ask your questions in the chat. Um, we'll gather those up and ask them at the end. Um, please stay on mute. And if you're following us on uh, any of the social media, um, Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, feel free to ask questions there. We'll be monitoring that and we'll gather those up um, at the end. So without further ado, Bill, if you would like to share your screen, I will toss the baton to you and we will just, we'll get started. All right, well, thanks Rufus for organizing this session and for everyone else who I'm presenting with. Uh, I hope this is a lot of fun. The aspect of science fiction that we're gonna be focusing on is largely around zombies, uh, but it's gonna to touch on a lot of other different things. So I think there'll definitely be a little bit of something for everyone. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and try to share my screen so we can get this presentation going. Just bear with me for a second. Okay. I'm assuming people can see this. Can I get a thumbs up? All right, fantastic. I'm going to get you guys out of the way so I can see. All right, so the, the portion I'm going to talk about um, with respect to zombies is how realistic would it be to maybe create a zombie, say in a laboratory or if an infection could do it? Uh, and uh, what sort of things can they do to take over the world? Is there a way to make 
a real world zombie? Are there examples of zombies in the natural world? Uh, so those are some of the things I'm gonna touch on. Uh, as, as Rufus said, my name is Bill Sullivan. I'm a professor over at IU School of Medicine. Uh, if you like these sorts of topics, I do all sorts of science and pop culture stuff. You're welcome to follow along there uh, or hook up at um, my author website, which has a lot of writings that surround this kind of material. So let's, let's jump right to it. And I'm gonna tell you about the first way that we could potentially make a zombie. And this is a really important one because this relates to the origins of zombies themselves. So toxins and poisons, ways to interfere with our biochemistry would be one of the premier ways that we could potentially make a zombie. So why am I showing you this cute little fish uh, in the context of uh, a zombie talk? Because this cute little fish can become quite deadly. When it is scared, uh, it blows up and you can see all these spikes and uh, those are poisonous. Uh, for those of you who don't recognize it, this is the notorious pufferfish. And I'm showing you this because it relates to the very origin of zombies, which goes all the way back to the voodoo religion, which uh, originated in Haiti um, in the, in the 16, 1700s. Sadly enough, it arose out of the slave, slave trade. So there's a lot of overtones of being enslaved that are imbued into this religion. And it also came about when uh, hypnosis was becoming a great fad. So that's another aspect of, of the voodoo religion. So the way this works is that there would be a bokor, which is, uh, I guess, the Western equivalent of a priest, who would administer a potion that would zombify the victim. And it would knock them out. They would appear to be dead. In some cases, they would actually be buried. Uh, but within the next day, they would be resurrected. They would have risen from the dead. And for the rest of their lives, they will now be a mental slave and property of the Bokor, unless the Bokor decides to sell the zombie to another person in which they then have to do whatever that person demands. So during the, during the process, when they were presumed to be dead, the Bokor trapped the person's soul in a jar and the soul would be forever destroyed if the zombie disobeyed the Bokor or their future master. But their soul would be preserved if they went through life um, uh, obeying what the Bokor says. So that's a crude explanation for what this uh, voodoo religion is all about and where we get the idea of zombies from. It's a lot different than what you see on TV and film these days, uh, but perhaps you can see some parallels. Now, an anthropologist named Wade Davis uh, back in the 70s and 80s, visited Haiti to try to understand what was going on here. He knew there had to be some kind of scientific explanation. And one of the things he investigated was the zombie powder that the Bokor was using to knock out his victims. And one of the primary ingredients was pufferfish. Okay, and I'm gonna come back to that in a minute, but just to go through the list here, there were also blue lizards, dried toad wrapped in sea worm, a couple plants that are hallucinogenic, and then crushed skull from a human corpse because, well, it's zombie powder. It has to have something really cool and eerie in it. So let's go back to this puffer fish. The main ingredient in the puffer fish that is related to making zombies is tetrodotoxin or TTX. And what this does is it blocks sodium channels in peripheral neurons. And it's important that you understand that peripheral neurons relates to just about everything in our body except our mind, okay? So the person would be completely paralyzed, but they would be fully conscious. And they would not be able to communicate to anyone uh, that they were um, you know, being manipulated in, in this way and that they weren't in fact dead. So many people who ingest puffer fish can be mistaken for being dead because of this toxin. Um, the TTX poisoning uh, would leave victims in a very peculiar state. The heartbeat slows down to, to levels where it's barely detectable, especially in a place like Haiti, where there's not a lot of sophisticated medical equipment. 
and uh, they would be uh, put into a crypt or even buried in a shallow grave. But as the toxin wears off and they regain mobility in those peripheral neurons, they're able to come back to life and move around again. But the tenets of the religion are so strong and they permeated the culture so intensely that the victims who are subjected to this process initiated by the Bokor basically become mesmerized by the process and they truly believe that their soul will be destroyed if they disobey the Bokor. Uh, so that's where we get zombies from and it introduces the idea that toxins that induce um, a type of peripheral uh, paralysis could be used to make uh, a zombie. So the second aspect that I want to talk about are pathogens, infectious agents that may be able to uh, give rise to zomb zombies or zombification. And the classic example, some of you may have already anticipated, is the rabies virus. Rabies infects all mammals and it transmits through the saliva after a bite takes place. So biting is the primary mechanism of transmission of the rabies virus. And what this virus does is it eventually goes to the brain. And once it gets to the brain, the victim becomes agitated and aggressive. There's foaming at the mouth, which is due to a paralysis of uh, the throat muscles and people can no longer swallow their saliva. Now this is beneficial for the virus because it hangs out in saliva and with high concentrations in the saliva and a behavioral change to induce aggression and biting, it basically sets itself up to be transmitted and have a high probability of disseminating through a population. Rabies also causes a number of um, neuropsychoses. It causes convulsions, delirium, hallucinations. Uh, it's an extremely uh, disturbing disease. And this photo is actually um, taken from a, a very unsettling video on YouTube where uh, a long time ago in areas where they, um, it was too late to give the rabies vaccine, they filmed individuals uh, who suffered and died from the disease. So you can see the progression and how terrifying uh, this, this disease truly is. And uh, it's been best described as erasing someone's humanity and leaving only the beast. So if, you're, if you want a classic example of maybe what inspired some of the zombies that we see in film today, you know, the aggressive ones, the biting ones, rabies is a wonderful example uh, that has striking parallels to zombification. Uh, but there's some other ones. Um, there's this parasitic worm called Myrconema or something like that. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, but this is a parasitic worm and it invades ants. So you don't need to worry about it. Uh, only if you have an ant farm would you need to worry about it. This parasitic worm is ingested by the ant and then it undergoes morphological and behavioral changes. The morphological changes are quite evident. You can see the ant's abdomen turn bright red, but the behavioral changes are the ant will basically march itself out onto a leaf where it is fully exposed and thrust its red belly into the air. And uh, normal ants obviously don't do anything like this. Now, a bird will come along, which normally doesn't eat ants, but mistakes this infected ant for a berry. So this is a process called fruit mimicry, where this worm has basically zombified the ant. Now the bird's gonna eat this ant and the worm now gets inside the bird and the bird will now poop it out as it flies all over creation, thus disseminating uh, that worm far and wide uh, to repeat uh, this transmission cycle. So um, really unique uh, instance of zombification. Now I am gonna tell you another one that humans do need to worry about. And this is a parasite, a single celled organism called Toxoplasma gondii. Uh, it's, so, it's the so-called cat parasite because its definitive host is the cat. It's the only organism on the planet where the parasite completes the sexual stage of its life cycle. And while the cat is infected, it will spew billions of parasitic oocysts into the litter box or the environment, the sandbox, the garden, or whatever. 
all animals can then become infected by these parasitic cysts. They're like little eggs out in the environment and they're stable for years. So some pretty bizarre things happen when it gets into animals that are not a cat, okay? The parasite will get into animals like mice and rodents and induce a very dramatic and unexpected behavioral change where they lose their fear of predators, including cats. So they're basically throwing themselves at cats, which then devour these infected mice so that the parasite gets back into the animal that it really wants to go into because it wants to have sex in the cat. That's really what it wants to do at the end of the day. And it is somehow rewired or reprogrammed a rodent brain to get it to throw itself at cats and other predators. Pretty remarkable feat of evolution. Uh, now, people can get this parasite too. In fact, a lot of people have this parasite. Like I said, we can get it from the cat litter, but also contaminated food, water, or soil. And it starts to do some really bizarre things to us as well. And it's really stealthy, okay? We, it doesn't show any signs of illness. You know, you'll never know that you got infected by this parasite. You'll never know your cat's infected. It's very stealthy. But this is one of your cells, okay? And this is what it normally looks like. Just sitting there, kind of like a ball, kind of boring, nondescript. But when it gets infected with this toxoplasma parasite, look what happens to it. It starts to dance. So this is an image actually taken from my lab. And we studied the mechanism of how the parasite can make the cell start moving. And it is advantageous for the parasite because once the cells start moving, they disseminate the parasite all over the rest of the body. And the place it wants to go to the most is the brain, just like it does in rodents. And this is how it gets there, by infecting cells and causing them to move you know, with these, uh, these foot-like extensions. So now that I told you that billions of people in the world have this parasite in their head, it raises the question, what is it doing to our brain? And that's a very recent question because this phenomena has only been discovered within the past few decades. So there's only been correlation studies. It's really hard to get people to cooperate in a laboratory setting to do a controlled study and allow us to infect them with toxoplasma. So we have to look at serology studies and make connections. So these are not causative studies, these are correlations, but they're tantalizing. And toxoplasma infection in humans has been indeed correlated with schizophrenia, rage disorder, anxiety, slowed uh, responses. And one of my favorite diseases ever, anti-NMDAR encephalitis. Don't have time to go into that, it's a whole nother talk. But this is a neurological disease that was discovered just 15 years ago that mimics the symptoms of demonic possession. And this might be why cats have been historically linked to the occult. Could be because of this parasite. Uh, really fascinating um, zombie-like parasite. Now, the third aspect I want to talk about with respect to making a zombie is brain injury. Our brain is susceptible to a wide variety of injuries, whether they be a physical blow to the head, whether they be a tumor, whether they be a parasite or other infectious agent like toxoplasma, or sometimes even old age um, or concussions and so on. Long story short, what these brain injuries can do is dramatically and profoundly change a person's behavior. For those of you who don't recognize this picture, this is the infamous clock tower shooter. So several decades ago, this all-American kid, Eagle Scout, never in trouble in his whole life, suddenly snapped one day and went on top of a clock tower and just started randomly shooting people on campus. It was found during his autopsy that he had a tumor in his brain pressing up against his amygdala which is the fear center of the brain. It's been associated with paranoia, um, hearing voices, uh, and, and so on. And it is being um, implicated as the causative agent that caused the dramatic change in this poor uh, person's um, uh, behavior and resulted in the heinous acts 
uh, that, he, that he committed. Another example I wanna tell you about is a very peculiar um, syndrome called Cotard's delusion. It is literally called walking corpse syndrome because the people who suffer from this believe that they are dead. They think that they are some kind of disembodied uh, spirit that is just kind of cursed to walk around in a body that may be decaying. Uh, this usually results from a head injury. And as that head injury slowly improves, this syndrome usually goes away, but it can have catastrophic consequences in the meantime, because the people who suffer from walking, course, walking corpse syndrome truly believe they're dead. So they don't bathe, they don't brush their teeth, they don't go to work, they don't even eat. In fact, a number of people suffering from this have starved to death because they won't eat. The part of the brain that is afflicted is the region of the brain that governs the boundaries of yourself. So it's like the self-defining region of the brain. It's the same region that gets disturbed when people have out-of-body experiences. So this sort of head injury can certainly um, lead us down the road where we can see zombification being a possibility. So the fourth and final one is a real quick example I'll give you, which is genetic engineering. And it's contingent on the other three factors that I already talked about. Because now that we know that toxins and pathogens and brain injury can affect people in very profound ways, we can now understand how we can possibly engineer this to happen at a genetic level or maybe an epigenetic level as well. With state-of-the-art gene editing tools like CRISPR and Cas9, it is becoming increasingly and perhaps unsettling easy to manipulate someone at the genomic level. So we don't, th this is still very far off in the future, I would say, but it is another possibility where we could manipulate someone at the level of their DNA to uh, induce symptoms that uh, lead, lead us towards, down the road towards zombification. And then the last thing, the last thought I'll leave you with is that you are in fact a zombie, you know, I, I, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, but that's what my book is about, the one Rufus alluded to. So um, excuse the shameless plug, but if you like this talk, I think you'll really enjoy the book, Pleased to Meet Me, because it talks all about the genes, the germs, and other curious forces that make us who we are. And I think you'll walk away from the book with a rather disturbing sense that you, you, you don't have as much free will or control over your actions and your personality as you might like to think. Uh, so that's the thought I'll leave you with and I'll look forward to taking your questions after the other presenters. And again, just thanks for coming and thanks so much for your attention. Awesome, uh, thank you so much, Bill, uh, for that talk. It is always fascinating to hear about uh, all of these different organisms and conditions that can lead us to behave in ways that we would never expect ourselves to. Um, so that's a uh, that's really fantastic chat. So without further ado, I think we're going to just hop over into um, our next speaker. We've already got some fantastic questions um, from Facebook and from Twitter. So keep sending those in if you have questions for Bill. Um, love the discussion, love what people are seeing. Um, our next speaker from the University of Edinburgh, um, Janet Philp from uh, the Anatomy Found. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna toss it right over because uh, I don't think people wanna hear me speak. We got a really good discussion going on uh, on the zombie side. So Jen, I'm gonna turn it over to you and let you, uh, you roll. <laughs> and you, uh, and you wanna unmute, uh, rock and roll. Right, there we go. Um, I, I'm going to blame that entirely on the fact that I'm coming from Edinburgh where it's actually half past 12 at night. So it's just gone midnight. Um, so if anything goes wrong, that's why. Um, but we'll start, share my screen here. So I'm going to be concentrating on the third part, really, of um, Bill's talk, and we're going to be looking at brain um, brain injuries 
and the science behind some of the brain injuries that happen to real people, which might explain some of the zombie characteristics that we see in films. So I usually start this talk by asking everybody in the room to get up and do a zombie impression. Um, so that's probably not going to work too well online, but if you want to get up and do a zombie impression, um, now is the time. I am going to leave it to Sean and his friends from Sean of the Dead to demonstrate the characteristics that we're going to be looking at tonight. <sighs> Yeah, it's pretty good. Okay. So, I'm just going to spend these 50 minutes looking at the three main characteristics, which hopefully you'll have got from that, are a slow sort of lumbering gait that zombies tend to have, um, moaning, they're, they're not tend to be very articulate, and we also have this vacant stare off into space. So, as I said, I'm going to look at some of the reasons behind why those might be occurring. Uh, so the first one, the slow lumbering gait. Uh, walking is actually really hard, which is why we, at the moment, cannot really get machines to do it. So walking is actually is a combination of weight transfer, but there's also trunk rotation, there's internal and external rotation of your hips, there's visual inputs, uh, there's balance inputs, there's various parts of your body that inform your brain where everything else is. Uh, it really comes down to one word, which is coordination. Um, coordination is perform performed by this small section at the back of your brain, which is called the cerebellum, which is literally the Latin for small brain. And you can see this is a map of various connections within your brain. Each of your brains has as many connections as the entire internet. And the cerebellum has more connections than anywhere else in your brain. And once the cerebellum gets affected coordination, one of the first things that, that goes is walking. And I'm gonna offer you two uh, examples of this. The first one is the fact that the cerebellum is the first part of the brain that's affected by alcohol. Um, so you can imagine, I'm sure we've all seen someone who's drunk. They, they have this sort of wide leg stance that gets them back um, from the bar at night. And there's also a disease um, called cerebellar ataxia. Ataxia just means degeneration, um, but this part of the brain stops working um, and we can see that the people that suffer from this have the same sort of gait. It's, it's used in coordination. As an example here, if we look at a cat, the cerebellum is a lot bigger in relation to the rest of its brain than it is in a person here. So somebody with cerebellar ataxia has this slow unsteady okay, gait, turn. Turn, that's which nice. looks kind of reminiscent of what we see in zombie films. The only issue with this is it's actually Good. quite turn. quick for your traditional zombie. I've got here a chase scene um, from Zombie versus Cockneys. So you can see this is a person in a, in a zimmer, a walking frame, being chased by a zombie. That's the usual speed of a chase scene in a zombie movie. Um, the man in the Zimmer frame actually gets away. So zombies are not really a threat when there's just the one of them. The threat comes when there's tons of them around. Um, it's rather like the old original Doctor Who, where you could get away from the Daleks just by walking upstairs. Um, so they had to come up and, and Daleks now fly. Um, but it's not a great position for the film genre if people could just walk away. Zombies aren't too much of a threat. Uh, so they sorted this out in uh, 2013 with World War Z, which apart from being just a Pepsi commercial that was an hour and a half long, is um, they, they concentrated on the fact that zombies in this regenerated really quickly. And the quicker you regenerate, the less brain damage you have, so the more coordinated you would be. Um, now, World War Z does also bring in an infectious agent which um, splits the, the zombie research field in half, so we're not going to mention that uh, too much now. We'll go on to the next thing, uh, which was moaning. 
Um, there's two parts of your brain that deal with speech. Um, they're both actually on the left-hand side of your brain, whether you are right or left-handed. Um, and they're called Wernicke's area and Broca's area. And now Wernicke's area, if you have damage here, that produces someone who can, they can still speak, but they don't make a hell of a lot of sense. Um, we all know people like that, but that is not your traditional zombie. So we will concentrate on Broca's area. Um, now Broca, this is Paul Broca here. He did a lot of work with this man who is called Patient Tan. Um, he's called that because that was apparently the only word he could say. Um, he could actually say quite a few words, but they were all rude. So when they published in medical journals, he became known as Patient Tan. But a lot of the things he said were just moans um, and groans. And when Patient Tan died, Paul Broker um, did an autopsy and found a lesion in this part of his brain, uh, which we now call Broca's area. But it's also very close to the parts of the brain that control the mouth and the vocal cords. So damage in Broca's area would cause speaking problems. If you have slight damage in Broca's area, then you communicate by something that's called telegraphia. So this goes back to when we used to send telegraphs and people were charged by the letter. So people spoke uh, as few words as they possibly could. Um, and in return to the living dead, uh, we see a zombie that gets into a police car, picks up the, the uh, radio and says, send more cops. Okay, so that is about as fluent as your traditional zombie gets, but it's it's an indicative sign of damage to Broca's area of the brain. Um, so that really leaves the vacant stare, which to be honest is the tip of an iceberg as to how conscious zombies actually are. Um, so we'll look at a few of the things um, that we see the effects of in films. So visual and face recognition are really quite complicated. Um, the information from your eyes doesn't stick to the rule that the left-hand side of your body is controlled by the right-hand side of your brain and vice versa. So the information from your eyes does what we call hemidesicate. So the information from one eye, half of it goes across to the other side of the brain and half of it stays on, on its own side of the brain. But if you can imagine that everything from the right-hand side of the visual field ends up on the left-hand side of the brain, uh, and really, this is down to the fact that your nose gets in the way. Um, so information has to come from both eyes. So this information goes to the back of the brain, to the occipital lobe here. And from there, there's two pathways. It either goes up to the parietal lobe, which is this section here, the top of your head behind your ear, or it goes to the temporal lobe, which is this horizontal bit here. And that deals with two different pathways that we'll look at now. So... People with parietal lobe damage, this bit here, oh, I lost my arrow, this bit up at the top, uh, they have difficulty paying attention to more than one thing at a time. And people with really severe parietal lobe damage tends to be on the right-hand side of the brain, suffer from something that we call neglect. So this causes them to totally ignore the left-hand side of the field of vision. So they will only eat the food on the right-hand side of their plate, um, and when they draw a clock, they will only draw the numbers on the right-hand side, or they'll only draw half a flower when they're asked to do this. Strangely enough, though, if they're shown these two pictures and asked which house they would rather stay in, they say they'd rather stay in the one at the top. So although they're not aware of the information getting in there, it is getting in there somehow. Um, now, an English... Um, psychologist did an interesting experiment with flashing dots on the side of screens um, and he discovered that he could tell if he told somebody pay attention to the left hand side or the right hand side then they saw more dots on the side of the screen that they were paying attention to which isn't too surprising but if he told somebody with parietal lobe damage to pay attention to one side of the screen or the other they also saw more dots on the side that, that, that they were paying attention to. But it didn't matter when he said this to the person, they always saw more dots on that side of the screen. So somebody without parietal lobe damage, if he told them too far in advance which side to look at, they would forget uh, and, and get normal scores on both sides. 
but parietal lobe damage, they could not draw their attention away from the side of the screen that he had led them to. Um, so we see this being exploited in Land of the Dead. So in this film, the human survivors let off fireworks before they go out to look for food. And the zombies, as long as the, the humans don't draw attention to themselves by making loud noises, the zombies cannot draw their attention away from the fireworks. So it's probably safe to say that the zombies have some sort of parietal lobe damage. Okay, so the vacant stare. I noticed in the chat somebody mentioned locked in syndrome. So this is what we're going to go back to World War One and talk about this. Uh, now, World War One, the world was going through a, a flu pandemic. I can't imagine what that's like. Um, but there was also another disease that was going on at the same time called lethargic encephalitis or encephalitis, I guess, for you guys. Um, and it killed over one and a half million people. But one of the characteristics was this vacant stare, wide opened mouth. At the time, they were actually described as being like zombies. Um, it is also called locked in syndrome, and it is the subject of the Robert De Niro and Robin Williams film Awakenings, if you've ever seen that. These people were in a completely catatonic state but they, they weren't sure how conscious they were of, of what was actually happening. They ended up, they treated these people with L-DOPA, which is a precursor to dopamine. Um, now there's pathways in your brain, there's a, a bit in the middle of your brain called your basal ganglia. And every movement and every decision you make goes through a sort of pathway in your brain called um, colloquially the should I, shouldn't I pathway. <laughs> Um, so should I, shouldn't I, and eventually you decide whether you should or not. Uh, and dopamine is one of the main uh, signaling chemicals in that pathway. Um, it's characteristic in um, Parkinson's disease. They're also um, deficient in dopamine. They have very low levels and they get stuck. Um, they can't initiate the movement because they get stuck in this should I, shouldn't I pathway. Um, and, and so you can see the vacant stare might well come from that. But the main thing about lethargic encephalitis was it got this man thinking. So this is Constantine von Ekimo. Um, he is an all action hero. He, he trained as a scientist and a doctor. Um, and then when World War I started, he became a fighter pilot. His uh, family persuaded him not to continue being a fighter pilot because life expectancy wasn't so great. So he gave up that. He married a princess um, and then became a famous doctor. And he had a theory that there was um, two pathways in your brain. One kept you awake and one made you go to sleep. And that you, you flipped between these two pathways like a switch. So you were either fully awake or you were fully asleep. <clears throat> so regardless of what you feel like in the morning, that is the way it works. His, his work has now been um, confirmed. And what's important about sleep is, apart from that, you never see zombies sleep. So we don't know, are they awake? Are they asleep? Are they locked in? We have no idea. But when you sleep, your brain doesn't sleep. Um, so it does what we call um, codes, the things that have happened during the day. So they're called episodic memories because they're literally memories of the episodes that have happened during that day. So if you think about where you have been, then the, the memories of the places get put into place cells in your brain. And the more often you go to that place, the more ingrained it becomes. So if you can't sleep like zombies, um, then you can't code episodic memories. Um, and so you have to rely on the pre-coded place cells that you've got in your brain. So I am going to suggest that that is why in zombie films, they tend to appear outside pubs or in American shopping malls, because that is where they're used to going. Now, the number one way to die in a zombie movie appears to be to assume that something of the original person remains and that they're going to recognise you. <coughs> and at the last minute, they won't kill you because they'll remember who you are. Now, face recognition is really complicated, but I wanted to just talk about two parts of it. So this is the pathway that goes down to the temporal lobe. So this is a brain that we're looking at from the underside. Um, this is the temporal lobe that would be beside your ear, which would be here. 
So this is on the underside of the brain. This is called the fusiform gyrus. And we have two diseases that affect the fusiform gyrus, which might explain why uh, zombies don't recognize people. So the first one is, uh, yeah, prosopagnosia. Um, we just call it face blindness. And we came across this uh, after the World Wars when two patients came back. Uh, they just referred to as S and A, the patients. And they appeared to be perfectly normal, although they'd had uh, injuries to this part of their brain. But occasionally, they wouldn't recognise somebody who was really close to them. Um, and on further uh, investigation, it turns out that they had created this really complicated way of recognising people. They weren't aware they were doing it, but they would recognise their close friends and family through various um, mannerisms and the clothes they wore and these sorts of things. And if they changed their haircut or their glasses, um, patients S and A could no longer recognise them. And it turns out that actually they couldn't tell the difference between men and women. And on further investigation, they couldn't even tell the difference between human and non-human. So that's the effect that damage down here can have. The other issue with that part of the brain is something called Capgras syndrome. So this is what uh, films like Invasion of the Body Snatchers are based on. So, so somebody with Capgras syndrome, um, they might recognise their wife. They might say that the person looks like their wife, behaves like their wife, has the memories of their wife, but they are absolutely convinced that that person is not their wife. So it, it's difficult to work out how the fusiform gyrus actually works because that has taken it both ways, either not recognising the person or recognising the person but believing that they are something else. I just want to finish by switching up a bit and going back to um, the Katars syndrome that Bill talked about. Um, so it's the the idea that science can explain everything. So I just want to demonstrate to you that, that it can't. Um, so as Bill said, this is when people believe that they are dead. Um, but I want to introduce you to Graham Harrison. So Graham Harrison tried to commit suicide and he ended up in hospital um, but he was convinced he had succeeded and that he was actually dead. So they did a lot of studies to try and work out why he believed he was dead. And eventually they put him through an MRI machine. And that is his brain scan. So the blue sections are under activity in the brain. Um, medical science can't explain why he is walking around and living normally with a brain that really does not appear to be working. Um, so although we can come up with lots of nice solutions, um, there are some things we just can't explain. So summary then, um, the strange walking gait is going to be due to damage to the cerebellum. The lack of speech is probably due to damage to the Broca's area on the left hand side of your brain. The inability to redirect their attention away from anything is going to be due to damage to the parietal lobe of the brain. Lack of sleep causes zombies to go back to their old haunts. And the inability to recognise faces is going to be due to damage to the fuzzy form area on the base of the brain. So I can leave you with a version of a human brain and a zombie brain scan that shows the areas of damage. And as Bill said, I'm happy to take any questions after we've heard all the speakers and we can sort them out in the chat. Thank you. I'll just stop sharing now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Janet. That a uh, lot of really good questions and uh, comments coming in through the chat during that one. Um, and a lot of people throwing out a lot of applause in the chat right now. Really enjoyed that one. Um, great, great presentation. I'm going to touch on just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, if you, a couple people came in during the presentation, um, this is the science of science fiction. Um, we are Indiana Sciences, um, and don't forget to turn in your tickets in the Gen Con uh, event area. So you just click uh, Submit Ticket, um, and I'll, without further ado, um, our next presenter, um, an electrical engineer, PE, professional engineer from here in Indianapolis, um, Rachel Cochran is going to be talking about the electrical grid during a zombie apocalypse. I like I said, I just I just move things along, so I won't I won't talk too much. Um, I'm going to turn it over to her um, without further ado, and just uh, thank you again to everybody 
um, who's following along on the live stream and everybody in here with us tonight. So Rachel, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks Rufus. Hello everyone. Um, like Rufus said, um, my name is Rachel Cochran. I am, I, I really hope that you enjoyed listening to Bill and Janet as much as I did. Um, I, I've done some presentations with Bill and he's always a hoot to listen to. Um, and I really hope I get to listen to Janet talk again because that was amazing. But if you liked those and you were expecting more, sorry, I'm gonna talk about electricity. Um, so let me share my screen here. All right, so like I said, I'm gonna talk about electricity because I'm an electrical engineer. Um, I actually work um, right here in Indianapolis. I work at a, a small women-owned business enterprise um, in an office building across from the convention center. And I've been working from home all week because it is really sad for me to um, see Georgia Street and Capitol so empty without everybody there. So. Uh, we really miss you here in Indianapolis. Thank you for joining us virtually. Um, I am a dog mom. He's awesome, but he's locked out of the room for now because um, he's gotten really needy with us being home all the time. And I'm a high school robotics coach. Um, I coach a first robotics competition team um, with some really amazing um, kids at Charles A. Tinley Accelerated School. Um, I'm a co-founder of Indiana Sciences. Um, Rufus explained that, so I won't uh, ramble on about that. Um, so how long can I keep watching Netflix during the zombie apocalypse? Um, how long are you gonna keep power in your home? Uh, I think we are getting an interesting, well, maybe a few months ago, we got a really interesting perspective on what happens to some of our infrastructure. Uh, when something bad happens. Um, so I don't know how many of you uh, are working from home right now um, and how many of you really struggled with that um, inter uh, internet connection and speed. Um, we've had outages, we've had speed issues, we've had, we've had it all um, at home and at my office. And, um, you know, that's, just, just part of the infrastructure that we rely on um, every day that we don't think about, all the things that are running um, under our feet and our roads um, that can really wreak havoc on our lives when they don't work correctly. So um, depending on, uh, on how your local utility um, has been handling some of these summer storms, I'm not sure which side of this page you prefer um, I think I'm ready to turn some of the, some of these friendly looking guys over to some of these guys. Um, but that's just, that's just Indianapolis power and light. Hopefully you're doing a little bit better where you are. Um, so when we're going to talk about what happens to, um, what happens to power utility when there's a zombie apocalypse. So um, I really like that um, Janet touched on the World War Z zombies and how they're super fast moving. Um, I'm not gonna talk about those. I'm gonna talk about like the, uh, the walking dead type zombie, um, really slow and kind of dumb uh, zombie. Um, with power generation, or was, well, sorry, with power utilities, there are, um, there are a lot of vulnerabilities. So as technology advances, uh, more and more becomes automated, um, but there are still, uh, there, there is still a need for 27 monitoring. Um, and the, almost all of North America um, is interconnected when it comes to um, power utilities. And there are, um, there are system operators that are kind of the go-betweens that regulate prices and demands and loads and make the utility companies play nice with each other. Um, and uh, they are like the most secure facilities. 
the one here locally, that's where I would try to get to if there was a zombie apocalypse, because I think it would be just the safest place if I could get inside. I don't think I could get inside, but the people in there will probably be pretty safe. Um, so the, the three big areas of vulnerability are the, um, the generation facilities, so the power plants, depending on where you live. Um, hopefully you have something a little bit greener. Here in Indiana, we have pretty much coal. Coal, coal, more coal. Um, and then there's transmission. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the difference between transmission and distribution here with the next slide. But transmission is really, um, when you hear people talk about the grid, um, that's transmission. And distribution. So that's what you see around you every day. Um, so if you have um, one of those uh, little cylindrical transformers on a pole behind your house and there's wires that are hanging and there's trees draped over them and it's going inside your house, that's distribution. So the first area that I'm gonna talk about um, with regards to a zombie apocalypse is gonna be generation. So um, just to, to give you some clarification, generation's easy, that's the power stations. And then all this stuff here, that's the grid. Right, so those are, um, if you ever if you drive through the mountains, um, you'll see these really big structures um, and these big transmission lines um, going across them for miles and miles and miles. Um, and then um, in your neighborhood, there's probably a substation somewhere and then you have this transmission or, or sorry, this distribution um, into your homes or into your office building or into your school. Um, so let's talk about generation first. Um, so how long the generation, um, stays up and running, how long it keeps generating power really depends on how your power is generated. So for all of you joining us from, uh, Indiana, well, it's going to really suck for us. So coal powered plants have to be refueled multiple times a week. Um, they need a constant uh, supply of coal. And so um, in the zombie apocalypse, now I, I have been really impressed um, in this current, uh, I, we're not quite at the apocalyptic point yet in the pandemic, I don't think, maybe, I'm not sure. But um, I think most industries that are uh, deemed essential I've actually been really surprised and I've thought about it in regards to this talk that I do um, because people, um, people that are deemed essential are really, um, it's, it's sad and it's noble. At the same time, they're, they're really putting themselves at risk um, to keep others safe, healthy, comfortable. Um, so I, I've wondered if I might be a little bit off on this. So it, it is possible that, that some of those delivery drivers, and I don't know if you've met any uh, truck drivers, but they can be some pretty tough guys. Um, you know, they might just be bulldozing hordes of zombies to get to the coal plant. I don't know. A lot of these are actually refueled uh, by train. And so it, it could last a little bit longer than a week, but you need, uh, probably one to two um, refuels a week, depending on um, your load and your location. So really not more than a week or two with coal. Natural gas, uh, natural gas uh, generation, that is, um, that's gonna depend on the pressure in the natural gas piping. Um, so here in central Indiana, we have a lot of natural gas. Um, lots of people have their furnace and their ovens and their dryers on natural gas. Um, so you can use that as long as there's pressure in the system. Um, but again, um, as far as supply and as far as the station being manned and maintained, um, you're probably gonna lose that utility after about a week. Um, and with, so with nuclear, um, this one, uh, I, I know it's a hot topic, but I, I love nuclear power. Um, I, it's, it's so, 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 so efficient. We do end up with nuclear waste. And so that's, you know, that has to be dealt with, but there's so little waste because it's so efficient. Um, 
you're looking at one week to a year. And what this depends on is how long you can keep the spent, um, if, if how long uh, you can keep those spent fuel rods cooled. So um, those spent fuel rods are typically put in a, it's sort of like a giant Olympic pool. It's it's this big lined thing and it's usually cooled with water. Um, and as long as you can keep those cool, you're safe. Um, so to keep those cool, you have to have power, right? So you have to keep generating power to keep power, to keep the spent fuel rods from exploding, from overheating and exploding. So um, it, it depends. It depends on how much fuel you have and it depends on your backup generators. But when the nuclear power plants fail, they fail catastrophically. Um, and then hydroelectric, um, hydroelectric is really cool. Uh, you can actually, um, you could abandon a hydroelectric plant and it could run on its own for months without human, uh, what, very minimal uh, human intervention. Um, but again, you have moving parts that'll fail and um, you know maintenance that isn't getting done. And so again, after about a year, um, even if you're in one of these lucky areas that aren't using um, coal or natural gas, um, you're, you're kind of out of luck. Um, so we're gonna talk about transmission next. So that is after it leaves the power station. Um, and sometimes this is overhead, sometimes this is underground. Um, but this, is, this isn't this is what you see through your neighborhood. This is what you see when you're um, driving through the country or driving through the mountains, or maybe you don't see it um, at all because some of it is underground, like I said. Um, so with this, this is really, um, a lot of this is overhead in, in the US and it's really susceptible to uh, physical attacks. Um, there is a book called uh, Lights Out um, that goes into detail about some of these vulnerabilities. Um, it also talks about some of the um, security vulnerabilities on the software side, uh, but one of the attacks that um, was addressed was um, some of these transmission substations, um, people brought like automatic weapons. It was like a, a half dozen people brought automatic weapons and attacked a transmission substation. And they caused like very minimal damage, but um, what happens when this type of equipment is damaged, um, those, um, those system operators that I talked about, they help balance out load and demand. So if you have a power station here, and they say, hey, our transmission substation, uh, a horde of zombies just you know, plowed through the, the security fence, they ran into the equipment, there was an arc flash, it melted the metal, there's sparks everywhere, like we need some help. Well, all of this infrastructure is interconnected with, so say this is Duke Energy here, well, you know, somewhere else there's an IPL station and they say, well, you know, we have, you know, we can bring some extra generation online um, and we'll sell it to you for this much. And, you know, it's all just electrons in the same metal conductors, but um, that's neither here nor there. So, um, so there's some, some horse trading and some adjusting of load and demand. And these people that are downstream can come back online really quick. Now, in a zombie apocalypse, uh, that's probably not going to happen. That might happen for the first few days. Um, but then you have people that start getting bitten by zombies. They become zombies. Um, you have people that are abandoning their jobs, trying to take their families somewhere safer. Um, you know, you have people turning into zombies while they're driving cars and running into uh, some of these physical structures and there's really not a lot of crews left to go out and repair these. So this just gets more and more damage as it goes on and there's nobody to, to uh, maintain or repair it. And so um, this, this stuff, uh, just on a regular day, this stuff gets damaged all the time here in Indianapolis. 
somebody drove their car into a, a utility pole earlier today and there was a whole neighborhood without power. So, I mean, just on a, just on a good day, this is vulnerable. Um, so about after a, a week, um, your transmission um, is going to be in, in really poor shape. It's, it's not gonna be transmitting um, electrons anymore. Um, so, and, and like I said here, this is really your most vulnerable um, just because of uh, physical structures. So lastly, I'm gonna talk about distribution. So this, um, now I did say that transmission is the most vulnerable, but um, so as, as you'll see here, these aren't uh, zombies. These are actually squirrels. I'm not sure if you're familiar. Uh, and this picture right here, this top picture, that was actually taken from my front porch um, when I was putting this presentation together. That's a bucket truck there doing something here to this. I don't, they closed off a lane. It was a whole thing. People were honking. Um, so the, the distribution in our neighborhoods um, and actually at my desk, um, there's a window right in front of me and it looks out into my alley and um, it is just a mess of wires. Like, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I don't know why we don't lose power more often, to be honest. When I look at the trees that are out there, it's, it's an absolute, absolute mess. Um, it's not maintained well. Uh, people don't trim their trees. We have uh, squirrel overpopulation. Um, and so what happens is you have people, you have really dedicated people. This is my assumption. This, if you haven't noticed, this presentation um, incorporates a lot of assumptions. You have really dedicated people that want to keep um, the, the generation facilities going. And, and they're trying to keep the transmission up and running, right? Because that's, that's directly downstream of the generation. Well, those crews that go out and um, replace uh, the rotten uh, wooden utility poles that trim back the trees. That is a year, like year round, 24 seven job. There's just like a crew of six guys that work for the city of Indianapolis. They just drive around and cut people's limbs back from power lines. Um, that doesn't happen. Those, those people are working on maintaining the transmission or, or repairing that infrastructure. The uh, nature takes over super, super fast. We have a tree we have to trim back twice a year or else it hangs down, like it, it hangs down so far, it touches our driveway. Um, it just weighs itself down. Um, so nature takes over super, super fast. I'm not a naturalist by any means. Um, I just know what I see in the construction world. Um, and uh, nature is trying to take the earth back from us, I think. Um, so, and it does that really quickly. Um, and then again, uh, like, like with the transmission, you have people turning into zombies and wrecking their cars um, into these utility poles. I'm sure you've all lost power uh, at least once in your life from somebody hitting a utility pole near your home or your office. Um, so I, I'm not really sure. Um, I hope you weren't expecting like some really uh, like puppies and rainbows outcome here. Um, we lose power like we, you know, a week, maybe a month. Um, uh, so I guess binge your Netflix now while you can, because you, you won't be able to during the zombie apocalypse. Um, so that's really, uh, that's really it. There's no happy ending to my story. Um, I hope you liked it. Um, I do, so when I make these assumptions, um, some of it's on observation, some of it's uh, uh, observation of things that, that actually happen like with the squirrels and the car accidents. Um, some of it is from watching zombie movies um, and zombie TV shows. But um, we also have really good examples of just uh, things that go wrong on normal days under normal operation, and we can see what would happen. Um, so um, in 2003, um, there was the Northeast blackout. So like I said, most of North America is interconnected on a grid. Um, and there was a bug in the software. Um, 
they put it into maintenance mode um, to shut down a portion of the grid to trim back trees safely. And uh, when they went back, um, or when they were finished with this, this maintenance, um, the load, so like I said, demand and load is constantly horse traded between different utilities and different plants. Um, and this bug didn't allow the proper redistribution after that line was reconnected after maintenance. Um, so it was, a, it was a very small localized outage for regular maintenance um, and it cascaded into a collapse of the entire Northeast region. Um, 45 million uh, people in eight states in the US, 10 million people in Ontario um, were without power. Um, that, was, that was a huge, huge event. Um, we, saw, uh, we saw a failure in 2011 um, with the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster. Um, so um, there was a tsunami. I think, um, I think most people are familiar with this. There was a tsunami um, and it caused a grid failure. Um, and like we talked about with uh, nuclear plants, um, they have um, they have emergency generators so that if they lose power temporarily, they can keep everything cooled and safe uh, while power comes back online. So there was a grid failure due to the tsunami, um, and it caused the emergency diesel generators to start. Now, these diesel generators were located either at ground level or below. Um, so this is a real, this is a design flaw. Um, so there are facilities, um, big important facilities here in central Indiana where their generators are located in the basement. Um, that is not something that I think is a good idea. Um, it takes a lot of design to properly exhaust those um, and to properly seal those vaults so that if there is a flood, those generators um, aren't taken out. Um, you probably see a lot of generators or um, generator enclosures um, in the backs of businesses. Um, that's at ground level and that's also susceptible. That takes a lot more flooding than a generator in the basement, but um, really ideally um, the generator should be on the roof in a penthouse, uh, but that is hugely expensive. Um, that's a huge cost in construction um, to build your structure to support those generators. So anyway, um, these, these diesel generators were flooded um, and they failed. and um, the, the spent fuel rods weren't, weren't cooled and it led to uh, meltdowns and uh, radioactive contaminants were released into the environment. Um, and then pretty much every year, uh, PG&E California wildfires. Um, so this is a really, um, it's, it's, it's really sad. Um, I think California has perpetually been on fire for most of my life. Um, in 2018, which was uh, a really famous uh, wildfire in California, um, a live wire broke free of a tower that was a quarter century past what was considered its useful life. So this was, um, this was a structure that should have been replaced um, over two decades ago and it failed um, as you would expect it to. Um, so we can see from just uh, failures that happen without zombies, uh, what we can expect to see with zombies. Um, so that's, that's kind of a little bit of background of where we get some of these assumptions from. And that's all I've got for you. Like I said, no happy ending. Sorry, uh, watch your Netflix now. Um, thank you for joining us virtually. Really appreciate it. And I will uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and turn it back over to our moderator. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rachel. That is always a fantastically uh, informative and also depressing <laughs> conversation. Um, one of the questions I saw uh, fly through real quick that uh, I will answer for you, Rachel, if that's okay. Uh, gasoline 
Uh, this is something we've had come up in previous talks. The half-life, the not half-life. This isn't nuclear. Um, the uh, period that gasoline will last in an airtight container, regular um, gasoline, is about six months before it starts to severely degrade. Um, so you, you have the less efficiency out of that uh, materials you can bust it. Um, you know, at six months it starts to degrade, and you get to about a year when it's just kind of uh, not going to explode correctly in an engine or combust correctly in an engine. So. Um, when you see them siphoning fuel out of cars in like season seven of The Walking Dead and we're like five or six years in, that's not going to work. <laughs> so don't, don't plan on that. Um, we had a ton of really amazing questions come in um, and I'm going to kind of go back down the line to get them answered. Um, again, I'm going to say if you're on social media, we've had a couple questions come through um, in Facebook and Twitch. Um, Send those in. We're monitoring. And we'll add them um, uh, to the to the queue. Uh, the first question. I'm going to toss it back over to Bill. Um, and this was an early question, so thank you for um, asking Pam on Facebook. Has there ever been a dolphin or whale with rabies? Good question. Um, not not to my knowledge. Uh, there, there have been cases of toxoplasmosis in dolphins and whales, which is pretty striking and speaks to the breadth of that parasite. But rabies, I think it is restricted to uh, um, the land animals, to the best of my knowledge. Interesting. When, that's new one for me. I, I hadn't heard that one. Um, it, I, I mean, unless a dog gets out to sea and... <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that the swimming dog uh, out there biting. Sweet, thank you, thank you, Bill. Um, the the next question um, I'm going to toss over uh, to to Janet. There are a couple of questions, and I I think uh, it'd be cool just for you to add uh, kind of just like a con uh, some clarification, some answers. Um, they mentioned. Uh, the, uh, the parallels between Parkinson's and the kind of zombie characteristics you mentioned. Could you talk a little bit more about, about that, Janet? Um, I, well, okay, so the, the combination comes from, from dopamine and this, this pathway in the basal ganglia, which is this should I, shouldn't I, so they can't. Um, one of the characteristics of Parkinson's is the inability to initiate movement. So quite often, um, they can't get up out of a chair or they don't they forget where they're going um which you can now they're suggesting you can actually help people with parkinson's by giving them really direct instructions so rather than like go to the next room it's go to the room and get this so so they don't have to make so many decisions as to what they're going to do um and it was really just the connection between that and lethargic encephalitis which was treated with dopamine um uh, and which if you've seen the film, it brings the people that, that were in a zombie-like state and it wakens them up and brings them back to being normal. Um, but it's a short, uh, it's a short thing and they go back to being locked in. It doesn't, uh, doesn't solve the problem completely, which in a way is even more depressing because they then, um, they are completely aware they're just locked in. So it's the, it's the, um, it's the conversation about how conscious zombies are whether there is a there is the still the human in there that is seeing all the things it's doing and it can't control what it's doing um or or whether they it is completely the person is gone and it, it's um, a complete new entity so so the only comparison between zombies and parkinson's disease just to, to really clarify is the brain chemicals I'm not suggesting that people with parkinson's disease are in any way related to zombies yes totally uh, aligned with that clarification. Uh, th thank you, Janet. Um, and it, and I think it goes back to that same idea of the, you know, the easiest way to die in the zombie apocalypse is to think the a person is still, you know, there. That's uh, that that comment that got me. Uh, Rachel, I'm going to toss this next question over to you. Um, this is, you know, talking about the demand spikes um, and then the cascade failure. What uh, what effect does it have if the demand, you know, if half the people are zombies, demand goes down significantly? Does that help or maybe it exacerbates uh, the problem? Maybe uh, speak a little bit to that. 
That is a really good point. Thank you to whoever asked that because I actually hadn't thought of that. Um, I would, uh, it could help or it could hurt. I think it would depend on when the zombie apocalypse happened. Um, so what time of day uh, everything really went to hell in a certain uh, city? What time of year? Um, so a lot of uh, maintenance outages are planned for whatever time of year um, demand is lower um, so they can take down uh, part of the generation, um, maintenance it, bring it back online without, um, w and still be able to meet the, the, um, the demand. So um, that, it really depends, but that is a great question. Um, you know, it could help or it could hurt. But thank you. I don't have an answer. Sorry. Kind of like my presentation. It's just, it's, we're going to lose power. Sorry. But thank you. Love it. Love it. That's, uh, <laughs> well, that's a, those are the good kind of questions, right? Those thought exercises. So um, maybe ping that one on, uh, on Twitter and we'll, we'll, we'll dig a little bit and we'll try and get an answer um, for you on that one. So a lot of good, a lot of good questions, a lot of good things rolling through. Um, one of the next questions, uh, I think we're going to loop around, do, 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 uh, and I just lost where I was. Um, goodness, I did lose that question. So the, <laughs> hi, oh, the, um, the next question, do, 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 do. I have completely lost it. So super moderator job here. Um, let me see if I can just hop on to the next one. I think big question. Oh, that's uh, <laughs> so let's go with, I totally lost what I was saying. That's <laughs> Hey, this is live uh, streaming. So apologies for the brain fart. So, um, Hopping into the idea of the squirrel um, losing power, I think I'm going to toss it back to Rachel to buy myself some time. Um, can you tell, explain the quick timeline of a squirrel blowing up on a uh, transformer and the timeline it takes to fix that today with the no zombie apocalypse? Um, so real quick, I'll answer another uh, uh, question slash comment that came through in the Zoom chat. Rufus and I are in the same room. Uh, that's why our decor matches. Um, so with a, with a squirrel causing a failure, um, it really depends. Oh, gosh, it depends. It depends on where you are. I'm sorry, that's my answer again. Um, so uh, I actually had this happen uh, a couple years ago. Um, sitting in my living room watching TV and there was a huge explosion and then everything went zoom, and the power went out. Um, and if you're familiar with Indianapolis and the Monon slash cultural trail, um, there was a squirrel that got on a utility pole along the Monon. Um, there are a bunch of trees along it and um, it chewed through something and it exploded on the, on the Monon and it was apparently really unpleasant for those that were um, in the vicinity. Um, so, um, so like I said, I, I work in construction, so I don't work in the power utility um, industry anymore. Um, so that's my, my most recent reference. Um, so I'll use that. Um, it took about five hours to get power back. And um, at the time I was living in, um, a, a north side suburb with a lot of resources. Um, so guess which one that is. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, that it depends on how much damage they cause. It depends on um, on what kind of resources. If you're um, in the middle of a city, if you have to close lanes down, um, if you're in a really rural area and you have to get crews out that have the right um, expertise and tools and supplies. Um, so yeah, it, it depends. Again, no answer. Sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cop out of this one too, sorry. So it sounds like, you know, 
even in an area without uh you know a zombie apocalypse several hours uh is something you're going to see i i found the question that i had been looking for and this one uh, we're going to loop back to bill um so bill there is a uh, Zombie cicadas popped through, uh, was trending for a little bit. There's a new um, fungus um, that produces psilocybin, I think, in the brain of cicadas. Um, what in the world is going on there? And uh, can, can you help us understand why 2020 has blessed us with zombie cicadas? Yeah, so there are actually a variety of fungal species that invade insects like the cicadas. And this one is um, very similar to one people might be more familiar with. And I'm not making this name up. It's called the zombie ant fungus. And it, it's true to its name. When these fungal spores uh, infect the ant, uh, they commandeer its brain and uh, consequently commandeer its body. And it causes a behavioral change in the ant in that it'll leave the colony and leave the forest floor and um, climb up a, a, a small plant or a small tree and attach itself to the underside of the leaf. Uh, so by this point, the fungus has now spread throughout the ant's body and stalks are even coming out of the ant's head. And as this ant dies, being completely consumed by the fungus now, the fungus will rain spores down onto his little ant buddies on the forest floor, thereby spreading the fungal infection uh, throughout other members of the colony. So it's very similar to what's happening to the cicadas. This fungus has the ability to alter the biochemistry of the insect's brain in a way that facilitates transmission of that fungus. Well, that is uh, fantastically terrifying. And diabolical. <laughs> I just, uh, I can just see, you know, at some point, you know, uh, there's an episode of, uh, of, of Fringe where a guy, uh, you know, emotionally compels people to go to the top of buildings. And I'm just thinking of people hopping onto buildings, trees growing out of their heads, and then phew, you know, uh, little spores of, uh, of brain control. That's, that's the visual you're probably leave with, with this. So, uh, <laughs> you're welcome. Um, our next, our next question, we're going to hop back, um, to Janet. Um, and, and the question, um, in the chat, you know, if, if we approach the idea of zombies from the direction of resulting, uh, from reduced brain function or brain damage, whichever mechanism, um, it seems to rule out the possibility of recovery, but of the topics that were covered, um, which of those you know, states would possibly be reversible beyond the lethargic uh, encephalitis case? The brain is one of these things, so neuro, neuroscience, people don't like teaching it to medics because there's large sections of it where you have to just admit that you don't know. Um, so the brain, there's large parts of it, we don't understand how it works and it quite often finds ways around things. But cerebellar, um, cerebellar ataxia, they don't recover from it. They, they learn how to walk and they, they can get some balance back but they always, um, they don't walk normally. Um, Parietal lobe damage, again, you don't recover from it. it it's the, the neglect is, is strange because the people don't realize they have it. Um, so the people that only eat food off of half their plate won't realize they've only eaten food off half their plate. Um, and if you turn the plate round, they'll, they'll eat the other half, but they're not aware uh, of, of the issues they have. Um, and the lethargic encephalitis, like I said, they, they treated it with L-dopa and the people became perfectly normal, but then things came back they got ticks and had seizures and they ended up going back to being fully locked in um so an awful lot of of brain damage caused by various things is it, people find a way around it rather than recovering from it um but we still don't really understand fully how the brain works so there's always hope yeah and i think that kind of that hits a kind of fundamental part of of science is is, is admitting and embracing that we don't know um, everything and that that 
search and quest for understanding is really what drives us in, in the sciences. So that's, I think that's the perfect note to end on, Janet. Thank you so much for teeing that up. Um, so what I'm gonna do real quick is I'm just gonna share my screen again. Um, I'm gonna say thank you so much to our speakers, Dr. Bill Sullivan, um, Dr. Janet Flip, and uh, Rachel Cochran. Um, I've got their social media accounts. Please follow them on Twitter. Um, and we are Indiana Sciences. We're a local nonprofit based here in Indiana. Um, please follow us. Um, thank you again so much for coming and don't forget to turn in your tickets. Um, that's all we got. It's 8.30. We're going to let you guys head out and enjoy the rest of the Gen Con. But please have a fantastic Gen Con. Follow us on social media. Check out the replays. Uh, and thank you all so much for joining us.